Hello everyone, happy Friday and welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch. I'm your host John Lorden and today we're going to be doing a, a case update on several Brain Scratch cases that I've covered previously. We're going to start with an update on Tyre Rada. We're going to move on to an update, uh, a few updates actually, on Kendrick Johnson and then we're going to conclude with the latest news on the Sandra Bland case and uh, in particular those last two cases, actually all these cases really seem to touch some raw nerves um, for people. So uh, I ask that you please keep yourselves open-minded, especially when commenting on these cases, and let's try to be respectful of each other's opinions. Uh, but let's go ahead and dive right in. We got an update from Crazy Cat Lady, the researcher on the Tyre Rada episode. And she wanted to let me know that um, they basically did a four episode documentary series called Shadow of Truth that apparently was made by the admins of the Facebook group that are working on this Tyre Rada case with other people. Now before we talk about the episode, um, she did go into the fact that several people in the Facebook group, uh, almost like the moderators, had a bit of a war over in over differing opinions and a bunch of moderators were kicked out and now there seems to be a group of moderators in control that are all sharing the same opinion and if you post anything outside of that opinion they will delete it um, sounds kind of closed-minded I'm not quite sure why they would go that way with it um, but the episode um, or the documentary that they did um, raised some interesting points that I wanted to run by you um, first of all, they did cover the Zadarov angle. Um, apparently, the whole first episode was dedicated to him. Uh, the second part, they showed some conflicting evidence that might point to his innocence. The third part focused on the suspicion of the teens, of other uh, classmates that might have been involved, which is um, what Tyre's mother has been known to comment and, and say before. But the fourth part... Uh, is a theory that we actually didn't cover in the episode about a guy who claimed back in 2012 that his former girlfriend told him she was the killer, showed him a bag with a bloody knife and bloody clothes. He said that she told him on the day of the murder she packed a bag with a knife, a change of clothes, put on a wig, wrapped her chest flat, wore a uniform shirt and a pair of his pants and left for the school, she waited in the bathroom for around two hours for a random victim to enter alone until Tyre came in. Um, that girl was around 20 at the time of the murder and previously a student uh, at Nofi Golan, at, which was the name of that school. Apparently this girl suffers from mental issues, schizophrenia, uh, claimed to have been caused by abuse by her grandfather as a child back in the Ukraine. Um, pretty ironic connection that she was Ukrainian as well. Um, and she mentioned including the wish to see, feel, smell, etc., blood and internal organs, cutting people open. She has been known to have been hospitalized in a mental in institution. Um, she also attacked another boyfriend with a broken bottle and bit a police officer who was called to the scene. Um, but police did interrogate her and found no connection to the murder. So. I just wanted to run this by you guys. Um, obviously it was a popular enough theory for them to cover it in this documentary series um, that was done in part with the Facebook group. Um, I don't know if it holds a lot of weight. Crazy Cat Lady asks some very good questions about it that don't seem to make sense. For example, the fact that the 10th graders were all gone on a field trip that day, so why did this girl go and wait in a bathroom that basically was hardly being used throughout the day until Tyre showed up there? So, um, And Crazy Cat Lady points out that Tyre was actually known to use one of the teacher's bathrooms regularly. Um, so what happened there? Why did Tyre choose to go to that bathroom that day? Maybe she knew that there was no other students in attendance that would usually use that bathroom uh, with the 10th graders being away. I don't know, once again, just kind of opens up more questions, but is this girl really connected to the death? Is this boyfriend spinning a story so they could get some type of media exposure around this? Very, very hard to tell, um, but I just wanted to pass that by all of you and thank Crazy Cat Lady for the update on all this. And once again, just put out that I hope that they get this crime um, reinvestigated and solved properly because 
Uh, I feel pretty confident with the information that I've reviewed that Zadarov, um, at least there should be reasonable doubt in his case, if not a, an acquittal of some kind. Um, and maybe that'll come in the future, I don't know, but it just it seems like an unfortunate case. Speaking of unfortunate cases, let's continue to Kendrick Johnson. And it's been a while since I've done an episode on Kendrick, so we're going to roll back the clock a little bit. This is an article from the Valdusta Daily Times from September 28th, 2015. And basically it just talks about the fact that the Bells dropped the Ebony lawsuit, but they do plan to refile. And if we move forward to ValdustaToday.com, we see on February 18th of 2016 this year that they indeed have refiled the defamation suit against Ebony Magazine. It doesn't really go into um, if the suit has been modified or changed uh, in any way, but um, it is just worth noting that they are still going after Fred Rosen for his coverage of the um, kind of the Bell Brother murder theory, I guess is what I would call it, on ebony.com. Uh, it is worth noting that when he wrote up that article, he did use aliases, um, but apparently the aliases were pretty thin and people were able to figure out, in the, at least in the community, that it was the Bell Brothers and that caused them a lot of grief, including death threats, um, which I, I don't think anyone can stand by or support. Um, that is one of the horrible things of... Uh, of just the internet nowadays is that people feel comfortable going faceless and nameless and sending horrible things like that. And uh, I, I truly wish that would stop for anyone involved with any of these cases. Part of this article does detail that the Bell suit claims that uh, Johnson Publishing and Rosen made no effort to verify the brothers' alibis before the articles were published. Of course, if they did any research, they would see that the brothers did not participate in an investigation. So you might question why would they think that they were going to talk to an investigative reporter. I definitely would not feel like, um, like that would be, I mean, I guess it would be worth a try, but I don't think that that would be a normal course of action. I'm really curious to see how this case plays out. Um, and unfortunately, this is a bit of a side case to this whole thing. The Bell family also has found, filed a countersuit um, to KJ's family and KJ's family, of course, had a big lawsuit um, leveraged against the Bell family, the school district, uh, all kinds of authority figures. We'll get into more details on that here pretty soon. Jumping over to CNN.com, um, this is from Victor Blackwell, who reported on this case originally and then kind of fell off the map with it. I thought he was actually included in some of the court proceedings and that's why they retracted him, but he is now reporting on this again. Attorney exits mark major shift in Kendrick Johnson death probe. And um, this is back from January 21st, 2016. The second U.S. attorney to oversee the federal investigation into the death of Valdosta, Georgia teen Kendrick Johnson is resigning, according to a statement on the Department of Justice's website. Stephen Dettelbach, the U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Ohio, will leave his post on February 5th and return to private practice according to the statement. Now I believe I did do an update about Michael Moore's resignation on the KJ case. He was the first uh, state attorney that was attached to it. I have not been able to find any statement about why Michael Moore left that case, just that he has gone back into private practice and apparently he's working at a law firm. Um, but this is very strange. You now have a second state attorney leaving their post when this case falls into their lap and um, it's strange because I think it would have been a perfect opportunity for this second attorney to say wow the first guy didn't know what he was doing this case is junk and let's bounce this out and stop all these proceedings right now um, which didn't happen and on the flip side of that coin, you could say, well, maybe there's something in this case that is so hard to deal with or hard to handle that these men do not want that responsibility and that's why they're abandoning their, abandoning their post. Um, I don't know, but I said it after Michael Moore resigned. I think it's unfortunate that this keeps happening because I'm pretty sure this is putting delays into how this case is being processed. Now, apparently it is staying in the same district um, I don't know if they're going to wait for a new state attorney to take place there or if they have other attorneys that are processing this. 
but just from my perspective, it can't do anything but delay these results, which is unfortunate because this this investigation has been going on too long. I've, I'm pretty sure everyone can agree that something very odd is happening here. Um, the Department of Justice investigation is coming up on two and a half years of being open at this point. I mean, if they have evidence, they need to press with that. If they don't, they need to drop this. It's really unfair um, to both families and to Valdusta. I look at uh, comment threads under these news articles and it sounds like that area is just tore apart by this whole case. And I don't think healing is going to be able to start until um, really until that DOJ inquiry is figured out and they process whatever they have to process out of it or retract whatever they have to retract. Whatever steps need to happen there need to happen so that people can start moving forward. Um, so we'll see how that comes out. Moving along, we have another CNN article, Victor Blackwell contributing, um, but this is relatively recent, March 1st, 2016. Kendrick, Johnson, Kendrick Johnson's family drops lawsuit, but intends to refile, attorney says. So much in the same fashion that the Bell family dropped their lawsuit against Ebony, Kendrick's family is now dropping this suit. Now, what caused that? Um, they're not being very clear about it. There is some talk that this might be helping the DOJ investigation. Back last October, the DOJ um, sent a motion to the court to have them stop their discovery process because they were worried it was going to impact the DOJ's investigation. The court did not stop and would not stop their discovery practices. Um, so is this Kendrick Johnson's family's attorney's way of giving the DOJ precedence? Uh, perhaps. Uh, but comments that I've seen from that legal team, seem to, they seem to think that, that the conclusion from the DOJ investigation is going to come soon and that that will help their case. And they have six months to refile this. Um, with this investigation being open two and a half years already, I don't know why they're assuming it's going to conclude anytime soon, especially, especially with this second attorney leaving it. Um, but that seems to be their belief as of the time of the writing of this article. Very tough, and it's weird because there's two separate stories going on here. You have the original mystery of Kendrick and what happened to Kendrick that day, and then you have these kind of legal antics that some of them are understandable. If you look in a lot of cases, sometimes lawsuits are brought up in an effort to create that, that discovery so that people have to open up their books, so that people have the right to subpoena information um, from other departments. and. I do believe that KJ's family was on that track and that's why their original lawsuit was so wide and named so many people. It would essentially give them the right to look into those people's uh, information to see if there was the pieces there to put together their overall conspiracy theory. Um, at this point, was that shotgun approach smart? I really don't know. Um, but that's where it's at right now. And there might be some fallout for it. This is as of March 11th, 2016. The defendants seek attorney's fees in dismissed Kendrick Johnson case. So according to, to court documents, the six different requests filed so far would mean the Johnson family would pay a combined total of more than $950,000 in legal fees for the defendants. This includes nearly $350,000 for the Lowndes County Board of Education and just over $240,000 for the Bell family who were named in the original 100 million wrongful death lawsuit. So now with this being filed, is this incentive for KJ's family to certainly refile within six months? Would that delay this process um, or perhaps knock it out if they're able to get a, a case together that can actually win in this? I really don't know. Um, this, the, the legal part of this story, quite honestly, just looks to be a mess. And uh, this isn't even including that the Bell family has a countersuit basically lodged over this lawsuit. And they don't intend to let that go from information that I've seen. Um, so the legal knots just seem to get tied thicker and thicker in this case. And are we any closer to the truth? Uh, at least publicly, I feel like that's a big firm no. Um, it's a bit unfortunate because 
in a lot of communication around this, I've seen people that are picking sides on this almost like it's a football game, and I think that's ridiculous. Uh, anyone that claims to know the truth in this case cannot know the truth in this case unless you were in the gym on that day, and none of us were. We know none of us were. So um, it's, it's really a shame that this is how things are playing out. Uh, it's really a shame in my mind that KJ's family kind of shot so wide initially with that first lawsuit. And um, I'm not sure that they really had their conspiracy theory uh, together enough or, or well enough in place for them to carry that lawsuit forward. And now it looks like they might pay a pretty hefty price for that decision. Um, and of course, you don't make those types of decisions without legal counsel. And, uh, you know, that fee is not going to come out of their pockets. So um, this might be yet more bad decisions in a case where it seems like a lot of people are making some some pretty bad decisions. Uh, and ultimately, does any of it bring KJ back? No. Um, does it bring justice for KJ? <sighs> Possibly at some point, but right now it looks like it's just grinding on these families in a very unfair way, at least from where I'm sitting. Moving over from one tough case into another, Sandra Bland, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the Sandra Bland case. That is the woman that was pulled over and uh, told she was gonna be lit up by the trooper that pulled her over. He then took her out of the car, got a bit rough with her. She um, went to prison and was found hanging from a plastic bag a few days later. Um, well, the trooper was fired. So as of March 2nd, 2016, um, he was actually let go from his position, and that is one of two things that are pretty much going to affect him from this point. He also has charges filed against him of perjury, um, and we can see from this article posted uh, just five days ago, at least from what I'm shooting this, former trooper pleads not guilty to perjury over arrest of Sandra Bland. If we jump into the details here a little bit, this is actually from NPR.org, but they're citing the AP. A county grand jury indicted Encinia in January on the perjury charge for saying in an affidavit that he removed a combative bland from her car after stopping her near Houston for a minor traffic violation so he could conduct a safer traffic investigation. Video of the stop shows Encinia drawing his stun gun and telling bland, quote, I will light you up. She can later be heard off camera screaming that he's about to break her wrists and complaining that he knocked her head into the ground. And Sunia's affidavit stated that, quote, he removed her from the vehicle to further conduct a safer traffic investigation, but grand jurors found that statement to be false, according to prosecutors. Um, that is not the only thing he lied about. If you watch the overall tape, uh, or just watch the brain scratch that I did on this originally, there are a few things that he misstates, particularly when he's talking to, I believe it's a, a senior officer of his after the fact. Um, and looking into this, he was already found by grand jurors um, to have committed perjury at some point. So how he can go through another trial process now and claim that he's innocent, pretty gutsy to me. Now, unfortunately, this trial, the most he can get out of this is like a $4,000 fine and or a year in prison. So perhaps it's some type of legal defense for him to file not guilty. Maybe they can get that worked down somehow so he doesn't have to spend as much time in jail or something. But um, apparently this first process made it so that he can't overturn this via some appeals process or something like that. So if nothing else, I think it's fairly certain that this man will not be practicing any type of law enforcement in the near future or most most likely for the rest of his life. Um, what I find unfortunate about that is I don't think that necessarily corrects the problem. I think that this was uh, just yet another case that points to an overarching problem that we've been facing in our country. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and right now recommend if you haven't seen my Geek and Dorks review for Peace Officer, watch that or just check out Peace Officer for yourself. Um, I was able to find it on Hulu, a very good documentary that's going into kind of the militar militarization of our police force. Um, and there's also a mindset that accompanies that. It's not just about them being handed equipment down from the military. Um, the whole mindset of what law enforcement duty is uh, has been shifting in this country pretty radically. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, um, if you look at statistics between the U.S. and the U.K. in terms of fatalities caused by police officers, uh, it's horrible. We are killing a lot more people, uh, apparently, than we have to when, when we look at that statistic. Uh, where the U.K. is hardly getting into those types of engagements, or they're able to solve them without, um, without using excessive force like that. So please check out Peace Officer uh, if you do get a chance. On top of this twist, this is an article from HuffingtonPost.com. There are some new doubts about the official version of Sandra Bland's death. Now, admittedly, some of the things they're talking about um, could be explained to some sloppy paperwork processing. They're talking about one report that talks about uh, her body temperature and the state of rigor mortis. Uh, and then on another report that was called in over the phone, that they don't have that information on there. Uh, that doesn't seem very strong to me. However, what is strong is there, are, there is some information on some of this reporting saying that uh, Bland was last seen at 8.01 a.m. on the morning of her death, but if you check the security footage, you can see that guards last visited her at 7.05. And that is a particular problem because, according to this, uh, state regulations require an hourly face-to-face -face check and if they did indeed check her, uh, there was, I think, a two-hour gap between when she was last checked and when she was found. If they did check at that middle spot, who knows? They might have been able to catch her in time to uh, perform some type of medical intervention, maybe save her life. And that indeed did not happen. So why is this report saying that they did something they didn't do? Is it trying to cover up uh, someone not doing their job properly? It seems pretty likely. And finally, in what might turn out to be a um, decent turn for this case. A judge has told the FBI to let Sandra Bland's family see the previously withheld Texas Rangers report on this investigation. Um, and if we jump into the details, this is posted at crimeblog.dallasnews.com, but this is quoting the Associated Press again. A judge has ordered the FBI to allow Sandra Bland's family to review a report of the Texas Rangers investigation into the woman's in-custody death. The FBI had initially declined to turn over the report, contending it was protected under law enforcement privilege. Bland was a black woman who died last summer in the Waller County Jail three days after being arrested. Authorities ruled her death a suicide, and Sania was charged with perjury after dash cam video appeared to show him yelling at Bland and escalating their confrontation. Um, I've never seen this picture of her before, but man, it just breaks my heart. Um, very unfortunate case, but uh, who knows what's in this particular file? Who knows what the family might find? This could be very good for the legal team. This could point to more evidence. Um, it could also just help the family get to a better understanding of there maybe not being a conspiracy in her death. Um, as usual, I really don't know. I don't have a belief um, going one way or the other at, on this case uh, or on KJ's case. I don't know what happened in that gym. I don't know what happened in that jail. I did watch the footage of, the, um, of Sandra's uh, time in jail. I think it's very unfortunate that the camera was only capturing the hallway. I think that's kind of silly with how cheap cameras are nowadays. Um, for you to have that responsibility of um, keeping people incarcerated, why wouldn't you have cameras that could actually see them in their cells? Some say that's a privacy issue. Look, they're not building these things with four walls, so I don't know how much of a privacy issue that would be. Uh, these cameras are not public information. It's not like you can tap in and watch your favorite inmate on the internet. So I don't think that argument really holds up very well. Um, but in any case, that is the update for Sandra Bland. And I think that's gonna be it for this edition of Brain Scratch. I know it's a little bit of a short one, but I wanted to be sure to get you guys something this week. Um, with me being away, it's a little tough to get all this work done ahead of time and still um, have releases for you guys, but I'm very proud and happy that I was able to put something together. As usual, links to everything we reviewed will be in the description box below, and please be sure to drop some comments, let us know your thoughts. Once again, I ask we all stay respectful um, while I, don't necessarily 
uh, have a strong belief one way or the other in terms of the theories presented in these cases. I know some of you do, so I just ask that uh, you keep those well worded and respect the different feelings and thoughts that other people might have. It's only by allowing that type of communication that we're able to look at this overall picture, review everyone's thoughts and feelings, and sometimes that leads us to better understanding and new theories. So. Um, as usual, I'm going to ask all of you to be the great brain scratchers you are. And thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have an excellent weekend, and I'll catch you on the next show on the Geek Dorks channel. Take care.